ทสเทสน่าจะน่าจะพร้อมแล้วนะคะท่านผู้ฟังทุกท่านนะคะค่ะไม่พร้อมไม่พร้อมไม่เป็นไรอาจารย์บอกโอเคค่ะก็เดี๋ยวกลับสวัสดีนะคะท่านผู้บรรยายแล้วก็ท่านผู้ฟังทุกท่านนะคะ Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen my name is Prakai Chan n i m k i n g l a t make it easier you can call me Amy it is very it it is my great pleasure to be your MC first of all I would like to welcome all of you back in the afternoon activities uh, according to the schedule in your hands and I guess you you all of you have it right with you The topic in the afternoon will be focusing on the current food safety concerns. We will have three concerning topics before coffee break, and another three before we end the day. Our first talk will be presented by Professor k a m o l l e l a t on functional food for health, and followed by Professor k o t c h a k o n d i r e c t i n on the topic of One Health, local issues to health concern, and we will close the first part with the presentation from. Professor Alexander, in the topic of food safety concerns in meat and perishable. Uh, well, before we start, I would like to give you a brief introduction about our speaker. Professor k a m o n l e r l a t graduated from Wisconsin Madison University and used to work at the Faculty of Agriculture, k o n k a t University, as director of Plant Breeding Center and also associate dean for research and technology transfer. His success work was mainly focuses on plant breeding, especially a purple waxy corn. Next speaker, Professor k o t c h a k o n she got her PhD at University of Minnesota in 2002. Currently, she is working at Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, k o n k a n University, as Associate Dean for Research and International Affairs and Lecturer. In the past 20 years, she has published more than 30 research articles. The next speaker is Professor Alexander. is currently working at UGA at the Department of Animal and Dairy Science. His research interests focus on pre- and post-harvest methodologies. That impact factors consider traits of value to the red meat industry and red meat animal produ producer. Well, I I think now it's about time to start. Uh, I I would like to invite Professor Dr. k a m o l l e l a t to give the first talk. Could everyone there keep come him on the stage, ka? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity. To present you in this topic, my point I have only three points here. One is uh, what and why functional food. Secondly, is about current situation on functional food development and case study. And oh, sorry, it should be number three: lesson learned and conclusion. Let's start with uh, more serious disease in this this century. Is about NCD. There are the CVD, cardiovascular disease. And uh, diabetes, cancer, and chronic respiratory disease. Yeah, it caused a big problem all over the world. The main cause is from the globalization, urbanization, and also the aging population. The first thing that we cannot avoid is the genetics. It's about age and heredity. The second thing we can do something with it. Main problem is because of the unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, tobacco use, and and alcohol. The thing that we can check is our blood. The doctor will give us to check our blood, and if uh, many signs happen, it will have the problem with this or uh, the list of the factor there. Uh, the serious one is unhealthy diet. Now a day we eat a lot of calorie, sugar, salt, and saturated fat, less in fruit and vegetable. This is the data. In 2010, nearly 43 million. Children under five years old are overweight. Uh, WHO estimated that about 2.3 billion will be overweight, and about 700 million will be obese by 2015. This is a serious one about the CVD. It uh, accumulate about uh, 70, no, no, uh, 76 percent, 76 percent causing death because of this disease. And the number will be increased from uh, 16.7 to uh, 24. How about the diabetes? The global uh, uh, problem, huh? the, uh, you can see the expenditure about the budget. It increased from uh, 900 something to about 1,000 
by billion US dollar by 2040. Very serious. How about the Thai situation? It's not looking good. You can see from this graph, all this is, is moving up by the sideways a little bit increase every year. How about dead lead? It's still the same. So the big problem for us now is the healthcare cost per year is about 200 billion baht annually and about 6 billion US dollar. Now let's see, we have the opportunity. Let's look at the whole food value chain here. Uh, we know and we learn from a lot of survey that the consumer want the taste, health, convenient and diversity and trendy. We cannot do anything with the population increase in terms of the aging and urbanization except US and North Korea start the big war, the third world war. Uh, healthcare costs, we can do something with that and also the food security and safety, we can increase that. We have the opportunity in terms of the functional food. What we have to do is, the first one is we have in terms of agriculture, we have to use the new production system. New variety, taste, health and convenience is the key. Also, in, in terms of the processing or manufacturer, in terms of food, we need a new product. A variety of the product. Use everything. Using the zero waste uh, uh, concept. And the new marketing is already on the way, the e-marketing. And so another one is that I, I say that is about the tourism. Every country can export without export. This is the key thing. Now, what are the functional food? They're just a uh, marketing term, not a legal one. There are many, but the key thing is about functional food is the food. Number one may be a natural one. Second one is food with the component that has uh, add and also the component has been removed. Some bad stuff will be removed. Food where one more component has been modified or the food in which bioavailability has been modified or the combination of both, of all. And the con conventional food that contain uh, naturally occurring bioactive substance like beta cocaine in oat and modify to enlist uh, it like margarine contain uh, phytosterol uh, it to lower serum cholesterol here and the synthesized food. This is another example. The whole food, we have many of that, especially in our local food. Uh, and also the modified one, fortified, enriched or enhanced, or the medical food, or food with special dietary uh, use. Food. Now, uh, uh, all the consumers learn and know that most of them want to go back to the real one. That means natural, organic, unprocessed, the whole food and additive free. This is uh, uh, just a simple of some of our, uh, our product export to the, the foreign country. The key, the key success is the organic. And another one is all damage, limitation. We have to reduce that. That means the sugar, salt, saturated fat, calorie, and food allergen. This is the example of the, the food product in the market with the label on the package. Zero cholesterol, no additive, additive fee. But one, one thing surprised that the price is quite expensive. It's like uh, uh, nampla, you know that, uh, fish sauce. With zero everything, but the price is more, exp uh, more expensive. And another one is enhancement, healthy aging, beauty, heart, everything. All the, the new products in the market now. Why? Why uh, uh, the functional food is uh, or the interest here? Yeah. Because the advance in science and technology. Uh, link diet to chronic disease list. Uh, decide to attend wellness to diet, aging population, healthcare costs, and change in food law, label and product claim. This is a very, very important one. Uh, the key one is that it's a big business. It's about, you can see here from uh, 2009, it's about 37 billion is, uh, for last year. It's about almost 160 billion in terms of the value of the, or the functional food in, in here. Let's see the picture about the Asia Pacific. You can see that, uh, uh, this is, uh, some country. For Thailand, the value is about, uh, three point too far for me to see, huh? 
2.3 billion or 2.7 something. Uh, and, and you can see that the National company. Oh, sorry. Uh, the big multinational company here, Big Ten, they are focusing on energy, cognitive, digestive, bone, joy, and health, uh, weight management, mood enhancement, and skin and beauty. You can see that all the ingredients, there are many of them. In terms of digestive health, it's a fiber. Heart health, there are many things in here. Okay, all, all the way down to the uh, brain health. Coincide Q10, many things that on the advertisement or on the package, you will see it. Uh, the analysis to cope with the CVD omega 3. You can see the omega 3 here. CVD cognitive is omega 3. Bone and joy is another omega 3 here. And omega 3 all the way except wage management. You need more fiber for this and high in protein. This is another uh, study uh, about the uh, phytochemical, the name and the, the plant part or the place they stay and also the uh, uh, the health, possible role in, for health. The, the, the two, two one I, I focus here is uh, one is uh, one is turmeric. This is a popular one for this year. A lot of research have been doing in the in the Europe and US now. Only Germany uh, is spent about 60 million euro to study about the uh, turmeric. You can see from that. And this is the research agenda. First one, they are focused on the benefit, naturally. Uh, energy, digestive health, mobility, waste management, cognitive, diabetes, and antioxidant. A lot focus on antioxidant. Second one is about the category, uh, dairy, food, vegetable, and grain. The third one is uh, nutrition need for senior or for sport nutrition. This is very popular now, especially all the high protein stuff for sport nutrition and also for the packaging there. And this is the Japanese case. They are focused in all state of life. They develop the product for each state, the variety of product that develop. This is the recently uh, the most popular one in the uh, in the Japan market, all the healthy drink, uh, include with uh, all the bacteria there. Uh, this one, uh, like lovely, can have support intestinal and improve immune system function. This one is uh, about uh, reduce the body fat, that means reduce the weight. And the third one is also the same. There are still a lot of them. This one is about three million cases. Uh, this is, uh, there are many of them. And this is with lot probiotic, chocolate, the new one, new functional uh, probiotic breakfast. And the high protein stuff for sport nutrition, high protein bar. Uh, a mixture of bean and, uh, and grains. And this one, you see that the new product in the Europe is uh, high protein ice cream. This is one from the old day. You can see here. Yeah, they said that superfood of Roman warrior, Lee Discover. This bean have very high protein. A per 100 gram is about 36, 36 gram of the protein. One egg is just only six. Both white and uh, yolk together. Only six. Uh, we may need just only two package of this. That should be enough per day for me. <laughs> six, uh, 70 kilo. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, this one is from the, they call the lupine. That means we have the opportunity for the old bio germ plasm. This is the recently developed. You can say that omega 3 come here. Bacteria in the gut, they are using the, the old grain and powers of bean. And this one, uh, they call the fishy goodness. This is the GMO. 
they obtain the they call M fat one gene from the matoid. They extract from the matoid and they put in the beef in China and in a number of countries. Make it more more omega three because we may we may sick of eating fish all all the time to get the omega three. So why why come to uh, why don't we come to the fish? And this is uh, all the gluten they put to increase. In terms of health, in terms of all the um, macro and micronutrient, all the phytochemical, especially the, the the key one now is the protein. Now, when we want to do the research in terms of the functional food, this is the way to do it. From the upstream point, this is the whole food value chain. From primary producer, we get raw material, then to the food manufacturing. To produce the food product and sell to the consumer, the product or the raw material may be go to the sideway to ingredient manufacturer with the special specialized technologies here, yeah, with the related industry, the dietary supplement and pharmaceutical industry. The research topic for the upstream is agriculture, breeding and production is very important to to get the best raw material. This is the key, and also. That one we miss and we lack of this research by physiological and medical research. You see that we need this one from the beginning. And how about the second part in the m i s t e a m food technology R&D, and also clinical study on efficacy and safety. Finally, is the consumer market research. In market research, confirm the effectiveness and safety. This is one example from Canada. They have the spearmint high in RA, bioactive, l o s m a l i n i c acid. High RA spearmint reduce joint inflammation in horses. Now they are study in clinical to test in human a t t i s t And about the uh, uh, resistant starch in corn, develop a new variety and produce the I don't know what is it, b a r g e l something like a donut. With uh, uh, high resistance corn c r o p they are studying in human now. Uh, how about the recently uh, research in the USDA for functional food? The key key thing here: evaluation of chemical and physical property of low value agricultural crop, not just the economic one, low value one, and. Product to enhance their use and value. This is just the example. There are many of them in here. And uh, the key, the key important factor for release the functional product, functional food is the health claim. It depends on the country. The FDA have the regulation that to be before you can release it, you have if you focus on the health claim, you have to have the scientific research to support. This is one example of the approval claim from the EU. You have to deliver 1.5 to 2.4 gram uh, gram, okay, for p l a n t s t o r e You can see that if you eat only healthy uh, diet, it will reduce LDL only maybe just only four or five uh, percent, okay. If you put more in uh, food with added. Uh, It may be up to 15, and with the s t a n i n g treatment with the medical, with the medicine, it about up about to to 40 percent. Okay, we have a variety of biodiversity o n our own germ plasm here. Not not only in Thailand or the Asian country, because we are in uh, uh, monsoon area. One crop that. In my case study here, is we call it the Pak Chiang Da. Okay, Pak Chiang Da. Uh, typical in the northern northern food, they eat it very, very, uh, for a long, long time. But this one they call it the uh, Chuka Killer. It good for diabetes. Uh, this old lady, she is the chairman of the small entrepreneur in the north. Her village develop the product that can export. You believe that? This one already start to export to a number of country. Here, yeah, this is uh, the picture of that product. This is uh, on the website. 
the price and this is the product you can buy it in many places the time drive for the development is take a long time uh, this is a uh, actually cinema uh, still west free is going a lot in india and it known that it treatment diabetic treatment for more than 2000 years but for our variety more than 100 years use as vegetable okay uh, the cooking northern thai cuisine and herbal medicine uh, for the time fly here there are two papers from the scientists from uh, japanese scientists they study and they found that our variety here tinima uh, in inodorum our species in thailand they are very good to suppress the glucose absorption in, in the esteem okay and these two papers and uh, and also we have one one just only few thai study okay and uh, this uh, uh, village they start the old top uh, during uh, 2004 and it's not a success so now come the help from the government side from the uh, NSCDA, the Biotech, Ministry of Science, Ministry of Agriculture come to help with the, all the uni university. Uh, we have one paper, uh, clinical trial on humans from Tula Lungkorn University in 2010. And uh, they get the TAV and start to export. They get the, the organic certification, it's very important to get the uh, the organic certification in terms of the uh, international standard and won the award of four star in 2004 they get the community product standard mark there are many marks for Thai and international and finally they are study to export it took them about how many years from 2004 2015 about 10 years this is the the picture once the scientists help First thing they have to identify the suitable uh, timing and part of hand to harvest. Just only six leaves from the top have to be harvested before nine o'clock in the morning. This is science scientific suggest. In the past, they harvest everything all the time, whatever they want. Uh, with the help from the uh, the government section or the business, they start to have the small equipment. And start their business and also you see that certification this is the international this is a Thai or your TMP is a Thai this is a hard hand to, to export the, the product the raw material have to be good and have to be uh, certified certified this is the, the result not big number this is, uh, they go for the trade fair in the Europe you see that Sell volume from small to large, 5,000 baht per month to uh, uh, 100,000 per month. It take them 10 years. And uh, market sell 70% via, via worldwide web, 30% from Facebook. New market system. Okay. No need for sale. Uh, uh, merchandise, middleman. Market 90% low for and 10% export. Expect. Okay, have uh, this is uh, our research here at KKU. We have a uh, 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 purple waxy corn. We use the crop. The purple one have very high in anthocyanin. Assistant Professor Chantani from uh, Food Technology Department developed uh, uh, anti uh, the purple purple dye, natural purple dye, and a company license uh, and produce a lot of high value product. This is a prototype of the the product developed from the purple crop in the past we never use it. Uh, we have a whole bunch of students and RA to help in terms of doing the research. Not just only one area, one person cannot do anything. Uh, this is the way we do the research. Agriculture, uh, by uh, science, uh, food science and uh, medical science working together and this is all the product development and go back to the user okay this is the name but all in time this is a recently developed product 
they use uh, the the purple color to port the white rice to the purple rice. And uh, this is a pilot project for the purple noodle. And uh, yogurt from the purple pond also. Uh, this is the example from uh, John Hopkins uh, Medical School. Uh, the super broccoli there. They developed, they found that the, the buckle spout very high in SDS. Okay. They do the research and then they start the business. Basic protection uh, product company. Introduce buckle spout to Japan. Why Japan? There's a good question. And also uh, develop the product extract. Extract SDS, uh, to, to to mix with and after they sell going up, they cannot handle it. They have to hire uh, the professional company to help to manage all the plan to work. And they change, uh, they rebrand it from SES to uh, TrueBox. Now they focus on extract uh, the substance from the seed and use to make with tea and coffee. And you, sorry, something wrong. Huh? Okay. This is the, the behind the success. All the data support you can see here. Uh, clinical trial 99, uh, study case 66, traditional folk use one, animal study, pharmacodynamic. A thousand of them. Just only one crop. Take very long time to do this. Okay, what we learn? Local resources provide many benefits with the 3P model. 3P model means the business model, profit, people, and credit for sustainability. Provide benefit to all sector in food value chain. We need the support. Success need the support from government and private sector. All the whole chain. Every, every component need leadership, time, and unity. Uh, we have to understand the need of three sector here. Consumer need, test health, diversity, and trending. Social needs, healthy aging, low health costs. And sign it. We have to do a lot because we are in sign. This is our look like uh, we have to work in this area. Finally, I think from very short time here, I can tell you that we have a big problem, not only in Thailand and all over the world about the NCD. The only way, only way to help, help in both problem on health care costs and also in agriculture, we need function of food to develop this one. For what? One bullet, many birds. And pioneer VS me too. And the key success factor is we have to adjust our mind. We have to change our work. Research as usual is not an option. We have to work together in all area. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Gamon. That was very impressive talk. Uh, I think that some of you probably have a question at the moment, but please save it up because we will have a question and answer session be after the talk from uh, Professor Alex. So next, I would like to invite uh, the next speaker, Professor Kochagon. Could everyone, could everyone welcome her as well? <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You just have seen the beauty part from Dr. Kamon. And now I will show you the dark side. <laughs> Please open up your mind. Uh, the example that I'm going to give you today is uh, apart from the, the well management commercial company intended for exporting. This is local issue okay and uh, in the next 30 minutes I would like to show you my point of view no reference it's just what I have seen okay as a local person as a veterinarian and as a representative from the faculty of veterinary medicine um, Um, 
being uh, the first veterinary school in the northeast uh, of Thailand. We have uh, one of our mission is to be the animal health hub for community. Of course, uh, our routine work uh, on academic service, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of animal disease. And we are also doing research and particularly focusing or uh, moving towards the, the One Health. Okay. What is One Health? This is what I've seen. It's quite different from a medical doctor because I'm a veterinarian. Okay. Uh, one Health is the, the health of animal and environment that could affect the health of people. But um, ideally, uh, in the context of the, the veterinarian, it means animals that are free from diseases or healthy animal, right? And it should be equally or a healthy animal in all parts of the world. So we don't have to worry about any disease. Uh, having the biggest land and the highest population make the Northeast region a uh, high potential for economic development. And uh, Northeast or Isan, locally we say that, also have advantage uh, by location connecting to uh, ASEAN or, sorry, CRMV country. Anyway. In rural area, in uh, our country, our neighboring uh, living style and eating habit is quite similar. It looks delicious for some, someone. It's fresh, right? <laughs> uh, there is nothing wrong in traditional food or cooking preference. But instead, animal hygiene or farming system need the improvement. If they are free from any disease, it's, it's safe to eat. And it's very nutritious. Uh, today I'm going to cover local issues that make us concerned about people health. Okay. In this uh, area, I will not talk about politics. Okay. Uh, this one. Traditional or culture is, is very difficult to change, so we don't, ha we don't want to change it. But uh, this part that's involved in animal production is agriculture, uh, the feed stuff that we give to the animal and animal disease. Also, when we know everything about these food chains, we need to uh, educate people to aware that they could get a uh, harmful disease from the food. Let's see, we are facing many problems, especially uh, disease in livestock. I can group because uh, I'm a veterinarian, so I so, so many diseases. Um, one is the biggest concern for human is the emerging and re-emerging infectious disease that happen very often in our country. Uh, international trade barrier disease, just as FMD, 
avian flu, classical swine fever, or pseudo rabies. That uh, many parts of the world they don't have this kind of disease. Uh, also, some other severe disease that affect uh, animal production. Also, this part is is also very important is the disease prevention and management. In particularly vaccination by security, national policy and animal movement. Animal movement. Very important. Especially in neighboring country we need we need to uh, make the understanding in order to control the outbreak of the disease. See, this is the real thing. Uh, for animal production issue, what I have seen is uh, most of the farm in rural area are not registered standard farm. It doesn't mean it's dangerous, but it's not in a, a, a good system. Okay. And many farms don't have uh, livestock quality assurance. And there is also no uh, supervision on antimicrobial or chemical, or toxic chemical uses. Many, many audience watching the heads and I think you are agree with me. For meat and milk produced locally do not meet international standard of quality or hygiene. Look delicious. <laughs> and many diseases occur in livestock and not all farmers are eager to check for contaminated feed ingredient. Neither are they aware that what animal eat could eventually pass to human. This needs a lot of work. It's very challenging for us. And still some more animal production issue. Standard disease prevention and management for epidemic outbreak are not implemented at many farms or at all farms. There are not enough animal personnel or veterinarian in rural area. Also, no readiness for disease outbreak or vaccine production. For educational issue, people, local people, not not everyone. I mean, majority. <laughs> I try to say in a, a polite way, but it's it, it's a real world. Okay. Local people are not recognized animal disease or toxic contaminant contaminated environment that could affect their health or could be harmful to them. This is due to not knowing or don't understand of the disease. Okay, and in Thailand, we are majority are Buddhists. We are so kind to the animal, and we live very close contact to them. We also have many stray dogs and cats roaming around us, and no one want to do or want to get rid of them. If someone dare to do that. You see, social is very strong in Thailand. 
and the more activists we will come up to you. Ah, hungry again. <laughs> Traditional food. Local people prefer, especially Isan regions, prefer freshly cured meat. It's delicious. <laughs> so they eat uncooked or raw fish, pork, or beef. No, there would not be any problem if the meat are free from disease. But from time to time, we got foodborne outbreak. And corn can hit uh, the top five of foodborne disease in the country. For salmonella, I think it's not uh, different from the U.S. It's about 160 cases per uh, 1,000 a hundred thousand population it's pretty much the same and from our research and many of the food even the fermented food we found some of them. so our job what we are going to do uh, in order to achieve a good health of people, we are working on animal health and community services, educational training, and being a center for knowledge exchange. We are also doing research for for one health. This is a uh, a little bit better than from what we see. We, ha we have a small animal hospital that can afford about 200 cases per day of small animal and 10 to 20 cases per day of uh, livestock. During summertime, what we are trying to do to cover up the, the the village livestock is uh, we set a camp that have so many students, vet students, to check the health of the livestock, deworm, and vaccination. Still, is not enough because uh, many rural area they don't have a veterinary. We also participate in uh, the One Health Education and Training Camp that bring together a uh, student, teacher, local officer in multiple disciplines in order to, to set up the solution for uh, based on community need, particularly on One Health. And in the year 2012, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine uh, assisted the National University of Laos at Na Bong, set up the, the first veterinary curriculum in Lao PDR. The Animal Teaching Hospital also accepts the uh, veterinary student from overseas for clinical training as well. And in each year, we also have the international conference. Especially earlier this year, we have a, a, a theme focusing on food safety. Almost time. Uh, ongoing research at our university cover uh, many areas, for example, disease of Ilan, of course, drug residue in food of livestock origin, antibiotic resistant bacteria 
vaccine development, herbal medicine, and probiotics for animal production. Lastly, I would like to say while we are moving toward one health in one world, we are indeed unique. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, yes. Thank you very much to Professor Gotchagon. Well, your talk just, just made me think what I, I just had at lunchtime. Okay, well, we, we will move forward to the next talk uh, from Professor Alex. So, could everyone welcome Professor Alex here too? Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you all today. Um, I'm going to take a little bit different approach with my talk going over uh, red meat. I'm not going to cover too much about poultry because uh, my boss, Dr. Pardew, is going to cover that a little bit later today. Um, but if you have some questions, I can kind of work my way around it a little bit. I spent two years in one of the largest protein manufacturers uh, right about the time our industry was going into HACCP implementation. And so that was a very interesting time in our industry as we worked through that entire process. Uh, and it was a very, uh, very steep learning curve for us. But primarily I want to talk about what we're doing in the United States from a red meat standpoint. Uh, particularly on beef and touch a little bit on some of the pork, but we tend not to see as many issues or concerns, especially from a regulatory standpoint, with pork as what we see with beef. Uh, so just the pictures that are that are up there, um, one of my former students, Amadan Pandrajan, uh, and it's an interesting story, Amadan was a Hindu and a vegetarian, and he came over and started to work with me, and his project was in beef safety and whole muscle non-intact meat products. And so uh, Amadon sitting there with a piece of sirloin, so off the back end of the animal, and he's inoculating it with some E. coli 0157H7. And then the second picture on the right, that's actually part of my laboratory. And so those are some... Uh, steers that we just had come through for a recent project that we've got. And one of the things you can notice about that facility, and it's pretty indicative of a lot of our larger industries when you go into it, is how clean even that floor is inside of there. Whenever we come out of our facility, whenever we're done for the day and do our cleanup, I would have no problem walking in and dropping a piece of bologna or hot dog or sausage on the floor bending down, picking it up, and eating it. Because we have to keep the facility that clean on an ongoing daily basis. Uh, the, the meats industry in the United States, is the red meat industry and poultry industry, I won't say they're the most regulated of the foods that we've got, but they are extremely regulated. We have a lot of controls in place. We have a lot of oversight from the government that we have to manage. And so... What I'm going to talk about today is really just an overview of some of the regulations that we're following, because basically each slide on here could become a semester-long lecture with all the regulations that we have and that we face. So I put this slide up primarily um, just to remind everybody and to remind myself and to remind a lot of our producers when we go out and talk to them that... Food safety really is what we call pasture to plate. It takes the entire industry to make sure that we have a safe, wholesome product going out to that consumer. And it starts at the production level. It starts at the farm, and it goes all the way down to mom and dad at home. Or not just the kitchen at the restaurant you're eating at, but even the individual that's serving you that food. Uh, whenever I was living in... Uh, north, northwest Arkansas, we had two major outbreaks, one of hepatitis A and one of norovirus. And both of those were traced back to service staff, not even kitchen staff. 
And we actually went through, and people in Fayetteville, Arkansas, had to go through and get vaccination protocols for hepatitis if they were working in that food industry in the area because it became that widespread. And what happened, it was an individual at a pizza restaurant that stayed open late and catered to all the other chefs and wait staff at the other restaurants that closed. And so the entire food industry in Fayetteville, Arkansas, was going to this one pizza place that was open late, had one infected employee that infected all the other staff in the area. Right? And so one of the things that we do have to pay attention to this is we do have some discontinuities or some disconnect in our food industry. A lot of times at the production level, and I'll talk more about some of the controls we have, but from a food safety standpoint, a lot of times our producers don't necessarily think about it. They're doing a lot of the right things. They're keeping animals clean. They're keeping facilities clean. But from a pathogen standpoint, that real food safety concern that we've got, uh, that Dr. Francisco presented earlier um, from the CDC, and I'll have those same figures again, they think that that's an issue that can be solved when it gets into the plant. So when that animal goes to slaughter. And it could be that. And it's also a fact that they don't necessarily have an incentive right now. And by incentive, I mean really a monetary incentive. Nobody has come back and sued the farm. Because sometimes that's hard to find on our traceback system. Or the plant that is buying their animals or the feedlot that's buying their animals is not paying them a bonus for the investment to do additional food safety protocols. And then on the entire other end of the spectrum, when we talk about the restaurants, and it really when we talk about mom and dad at home, they feel that the food safety really isn't their concern either because the product should be 100% safe when it gets to them from the grocery store. And so from the plant is where it should be safe, the grocery store is just kind of holding on to it. And so it shouldn't matter really what they do to it. It should be safe. And in reality, contamination can occur at any point. But we can have some small levels of contamination when we get into the slaughter and processing. But the contamination is exacerbated and can be amplified most times at home and at food service, largely by mishandling of that product. Um, one of the biggest things I talk about, I'll take students out to a grocery store every year. And I tell them, just watch people. And when I do this, I usually end up with about 15 or 20 customers at the grocery store walking behind me as well. But we go and I tell them, just, just watch people. In Georgia, you know, we're about 90 degrees a good portion of the year. So it's hot outside. Inside, it's about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Customers come in, and the first thing they do is they tend to go to the outside of the grocery store. Well, that's where our fruits and vegetables are. The bakery is. And then they make a stop at the meat counter in the back. And so that's one of the first things that they pull out and they put in their grocery cart. And then they spend another hour, hour and a half with that meat walking around the grocery store, filling the grocery cart up. And then they go to checkout. Well, now that car has been sitting outside 90 degrees for a couple of hours. And they take that meat and they put it in a 90 degree car. Actually, by that time, the car is probably 120 degrees. And then they go pick up the kids. And then they stop and get a coffee. And then they get home. And they unload the groceries from the car, but they just put them on the counter until they can get the kids settled, get them a snack. And so now that product's been temperature abused for two, three, four hours sometimes. And so a very small amount of bacteria that might have been on that product through the production chain going into the grocery store has now had the opportunity to grow. Not to mention they might take that meat product and just put it on the counter. It might be leaking a little bit, and they don't bother to clean up the countertop. And so we can see how these problems can start to progress as we go along throughout the system. Um, one of the biggest things that I really kind of hone in on with this is a little bit of what consider common sense or thought about what we're doing, how we're handling that product. And sanitation, even at home, 
goes an extremely long way. Like I heard earlier, simply washing your hands on a consistent basis goes a long way. Putting raw meat, raw produce on a countertop, cleaning it off, making sure it's bagged properly so it doesn't leak while it's in the car or the container. Um, a big thing we see with consumers is they don't like the plastic bags. And I'm not a fan of them either. I grew up with the paper bags, and that's what I still like. But they like these canvas bags that are reusable. Well, they'll take that canvas bag and they'll put their meat in it, and then they'll take it home, and they'll fold up the canvas bag and put it back in the trunk of the car. Never wash the canvas bag. And what we found is we actually end up with high amounts of bacteria in those reusable bags because they're not being properly cleaned. And so that bag is actually transferring bacteria from one shopping trip to the next. So a little bit of sanitation goes a really long way with this. When we talk about regulations, um, I said I'm, I'm primarily going to talk regulation from that uh, pathogen side and what USDA has us doing. Um, and on the farm, from that standpoint, we don't have any regulations in the United States. But the farm does have a lot of other controls in place. I've heard a lot of talk about antibiotic resistance and the use of antibiotics and vaccines, anthemintics or dewormers on the farm. We do use all of those on the farm, and we use them very judiciously, and we have a lot of laws that govern their use. And so our antibiotics, we don't use them to promote growth anymore. That has been removed from the label. We use them under veterinary care now. Um, we can use them subtherapeutically if we need to. Um, and I, I equate that to, you know, my daughter's in preschool. They just had another case of hand, foot, and mouth. If I had the option, instead of having her get hand, foot, and mouth again, I'd just soon go give her the antibiotic now in a subtherapeutic dose than have to wait till she gets sick again. We can't do that in human medicine. But we can do that with, with our animals to an extent. But we have to do that under veterinary care now. Um, using dewormers or anthemintics. Our producers have become very good at using the anthemintics, keeping parasites out. Um, so we don't have to worry about getting tapeworms, roundworms, liver flukes, things like that in our food supply. We've got programs that we call beef quality assurance, pork quality assurance. We have a dairy quality assurance that I'm sure John might touch on later. And we even have a trucker quality assurance. And that is a quality assurance program um, that trains just the individuals that are transporting our animals from the farm to the slaughter facility. And through these programs, they're really there for quality standards, but those quality standards have gone a long way in ensuring that we don't have some other uh, foodborne illnesses getting through the system by clean facilities, clean farms, clean trucks, uh, making sure we're sanitizing in between making sure we're working those animals in a low-stress situation, uh, making sure that we're using medications judiciously and recording their use so that we can keep track and make sure that animals that have an active vaccine or active antibiotic in their system aren't making their way on through the slaughter phase. Um, the meats industry, so once they get onto to my side of the fence, that's where we actually get a lot of the regulation. We are primarily governed by the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service. I mean, if you're not that familiar with USDA, I highlight Food Safety Inspection Service because there are a lot of different parts within the USDA. And we really start with the Meat Inspection Act. And this dates back to 1906 is where this started. And we've updated it over time. It's under continuous evaluation and update. But some of the biggest things we do, and I've taken out a lot of the pictures that I tend to use, um, especially after lunch, because I do have some fairly graphic pictures that go along with some of these. But our main thing is that animal, when it comes to us from a slaughter standpoint, it is at that point under antemortem inspection. All right, so it is under the inspection of the plant and under the control of the plant and under the control of the inspectors we have. Before slaughter, the inspector has to go out and look at that animal. Every single animal has to be looked at. And they have to look at it at rest and in motion. And so if that animal is laying down, we actually have to go out there and get that animal up and move it around so the inspector can see it. 
And what they're looking for is anything that might give an indication that that animal's sick, that it has an illness. Just like us. They'll hold its head down. It'll have a runny nose. It'll wheeze. It'll cough. All of those are indicators that there's something wrong. And so what they're doing is they're preventing anything that's disabled, diseased, dying, or dead does not enter the food system. Okay? If they see something that looks maybe suspect, so we've got three outcomes here. That animal can be passed, which means it can go into slaughter. The second one is that animal can be condemned. And so if they see something that they don't like from an inspection standpoint, if it's not our veterinarian that's there, then they have to call the veterinarian in charge, and that veterinarian will come out, take samples, and if need be, condemn that animal. If that animal is condemned, we euthanize it outside, and we have to call somebody else to come get it. It never enters the food supply. That animal can also be claimed as suspect. So that means they found something that looks a little wrong. In that case... They'll again call the veterinarian in charge. They'll come out. We have to move it to a separate pen for observation, and the veterinarian's going to take temperature, fecal, urine, blood, and record that throughout the day. At the end of the day, if they say, I think it's all right, then we can move it through and slaughter it. And if we do so, they're going to do a lot more inspection and pull a lot more samples post mortem. If they don't think it's okay, then they condemn it. If they condemn it, again, there's no argument. That's the way it is. So if that animal's passed and it goes in and we go to slaughter, we stun it, render it insensible to pain, we bleed it out. At this point, as soon as it walks in and we apply the stun to render that animal unconscious or insensible to pain, we start post-mortem inspection. And post-mortem inspection is a continuous process that goes from the minute that animal walks in until that product is delivered at the retail segment. That product is always under inspection at that point. Okay. And the big things with post-mortem inspection, they're looking for disease, especially communicable diseases. So even though we don't have a problem with parasites, they're still going to go through and look around that carcass and incise and take samples, make sure we don't have roundworms, tapeworms, liver flukes are the big ones that they're looking at. They're going to incise the lymph nodes. Just like us, when we get sick, we start to swell right here and get sore. So they're going to come in and they're going to excise those lymph nodes, make sure that they're not swollen, discolored. If they are, that tells the inspector that, that animal's probably fighting something, that it might have an infection. If the inspector, while that animal was live, saw a knot on its neck, because that's where we give our injections, is in the neck. If it's got a knot, that means it probably got an injection recently. Withdrawal time maybe hasn't been met. And so they're going to take more samples out of that carcass to make sure. All right, so we're really looking at disease residues from a drug standpoint to make sure that they're not entering the food supply. And then also our process control, our standard operating procedures and our standard sanitation operating procedures. Make sure that that's all effective. And then we also have HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And so this became a law after 1996 and rolled out depending on the size of the plant. Um, if you're not familiar with HACCP, it's a seven-step process where basically we have to come in and evaluate every single thing we do for every process. And we have to identify, can something potentially occur, be it biological, physical, or chemical? If it can occur, how do we stop it? Where do we stop it? What are the levels that are acceptable? And sometimes it's zero. And if it does get through and past us, what are our corrective actions? So we actually have to have a plan in place to fix a problem that we haven't even had yet. All right. And so we have to follow that very closely. And then finally, we've got the Food Safety Modernization Act. Now, FISMA is not necessarily USDA. FISMA is FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. But USDA is paying close attention and working very closely with FDA on FISMA because if we have a complex product, so say we're making a pizza, that pizza is under FDA guidelines until we put pepperoni, hamburger, sausage, something like that on it. Now that pizza is under both FDA and USDA guidelines. 
And so we have to know and understand the Food Safety Modernization Act as well. Um, retail, our concerns at retail are the local municipality and really focusing on sanitation, both the facility and the employees. Our federal inspection stops once it gets to retail point. Okay, That, that becomes local at that point. Um, but we do have some other guidelines now with, with certain products that, that we'll talk about um, concerning what's happening at the retail segment. And then finally at home, the regulatory authority at home is mom and dad. And we know that they're not always effective. They mean best, but I've had food poisoning several times, and I'm pretty sure a couple of those came from home, both as a kid with mom and dad and probably with my wife. You'll notice I'll pick a lot on my family. But my, mom, my wife's idea when she cooks is she'll take that chicken breast. She'll put it on the countertop, get it ready. She'll put it on the pan, put it in the oven. She'll take a towel and just wipe off the countertop. That towel then gets thrown over her shoulder as she goes to start preparing everything else. Five minutes later, she'll come in, she'll open up the oven, grab a fork and a knife, stick it in that chicken breast and cut it open, take a look to see if it's done. Oh, not done, and puts the knife and the fork back on the countertop. So just contaminated the knife and the fork. Then she was salmonella. Put it back on the countertop that just had the chicken on it. Five minutes later, she'll open the oven door, grab that same knife and fork, cut into it again. And so now that chicken might have been fully cooked and might have gotten rid of all the bacteria, but she just put it back on. And so we have to be very careful about some of those issues. And that just goes to training the consumer. And that becomes very difficult. Um, these are some numbers that you saw earlier, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, and I like Francisco's 1 in 10 better. That's probably a more updated number um, with our current population instead of the 1 in 6. Um, but these came off the CDC and just shows total number of illnesses um, that we've had. And then from a known agent and unknown agents, unspecified agents. And the unspecified agents can come from, we just don't know. They can come from somebody was traveling abroad and came home and had it. But like you said, these are estimates. Last time I got food poisoning and food illness, I didn't go to the hospital. It wasn't reported to anybody. Okay, So these are best guess, and we give ourselves some variation within there um, based upon the, the modeling. But like I said, what's interesting is we know about 20%. So 80% are unknown, and that becomes a major issue with our industry. It's job security for a lot of us. But it's something we got to get a handle on and figure out what it is because we can't fix it if we can't measure it. And so we've got to be able to start measuring this and identify it so we can move on and start fixing the problem. Um, this is looking at the top five um, bacteria, bacteria and norovirus is up there as well. Um, Foodborne acquired illnesses from the known population. And so I've got up there, and actually the third one, Clostridium perfringens, should have a green star by it as well. I missed that one. But the red star means things we're concerned about from a regulatory standpoint in red meat on a raw product. And the green star is going to be on a thermally processed, ready-to-eat product. All right? The reason I don't have norovirus up there, even though that is a concern, is usually that is something that happens at a food handling standpoint later on, not within our processing situation. And so really from illness, we've got Salmonella, Clostridium perfringens, and uh, Staph aureus. Campylobacter I didn't highlight, but Campylobacter is on the radar of USDA. And so they are paying close attention to it in poultry and in red meat. Um, the bottom graph shows illness resulting in hospitals. And again, Salmonella, non-typhoidal, is up at the top. We've got Campylobacter again, and down at the bottom we have E. coli. And so this is the 0157H7. And so the one that's been around or that we've known about the longest and had controls on the longest. It's not up in the top for foodborne illness. We do a really good job of controlling E. coli 0157H7. But if you get it, and it only takes about 10 cells to make you sick, you do stand a good chance of ending up in the hospital. And this one's the ones that result in death. 
right? And so Salmonella is up there, and then Listeria monocytogenes. So Salmonella, we're really concerned about on the fresh side. Listeria on the ready-to-eat side is really where we're focusing our concern at. So we look at the associated foods, um, and I've got complex foods and simple foods, and this also came from the CDC. We're about 50-50 between what's known to be causing foodborne illness. And so we can't really point and say, well, it's their fault or it's their fault. We know that both sides still have a role to play in fixing the problem. All right? So like I said, on the complex side for meat products, it's both FDA and USDA. On the simple side, where it's just the meat and processing aids or ingredients that go into the raw meat, it's USDA side. Now, we've done a really good job. We've actually seen the number of foodborne illness come down. After HACCP was implemented, we saw the number of recalls decrease. Here recently, we've seen the number of recalls tick back up a little bit. Now, a lot of those have been due to mislabeling or misbranding of allergens that's on there. But we have seen them go up for E. coli, Listeria, and some of these others. But the illness hasn't gone up with them, maybe because of the modeling, but maybe because we know what to look for and how to look for it even better. And so we're actually finding it earlier before that product gets out to the consumer and being able to get it back under our control. And so with that, if we look at the numbers up here, we can see that produce is actually at the top for illness. And it's been something in the meats industry that's bothered us for a while because we've known that they're up there. It's very hard to control bacteria and produce. All right? But meat is still number two. And in fact, when we look at the deaths, it accounts for 29%. And so we've done a really good job, but we know we still have a long way to go here. All right? And we follow up with dairy and eggs and fish and shellfish. So we look at our current major focus on raw products, salmonella is there. We know it's there, and it's a problem, and we're working on it. We've got controls. But a lot of times we control salmonella by controlling E. coli 0157H7. A lot of times if we control E. coli, we can also take care of salmonella as well. And so E. coli 0157H7 is an adulterant. And so it is not allowed in any numbers in food products or in meat products at all. So if you find it at all, that product either has to be condemned or moved to another avenue where it's fully cooked under a process that's validated to kill E. coli. And this came out and become, <coughs> become labeled as an adulterant in 1993. And so we had a major outbreak due to mishandling, miscooking of ground beef patties in the Pacific Northwest. We've known about E. coli since the mid-80s, but in 1993, when it went to the fast food chain, it ended up making a bunch of kids sick. And it went, when it made a bunch of kids sick, people got really upset. And so USDA said something's got to be done, and it was declared as an adulterant, and that's when we started working. That's also how we ended up with HACCP in the meat industry as well. In 1994... E. coli was also declared an adulterant in our comminuted and ready-to-eat products, so fermented sausages and things like that that did not receive a heat treatment. And then in 1999, it was added as an adulterant to what we call whole muscle non-intact products. And so we covered ground products, but we, were, we are utilizing technology where we will enhance or pre-marinate product using needle injection or using blade tenderization. And by doing so, if there's anything on the surface, when those blades come in, they can translocate any bacteria into the middle. And so if that product isn't handled and cooked properly, that bacteria could survive. And so they stated you have to come in and make sure that you are getting rid of E. coli and that whole muscle non-intact product as well. Um, other ones were added, what we call the big six. So the non-0157H7S techs were added in 2011. And so we don't necessarily see the amount of death coming from these as we do 0157H7, but these six actually do account for a greater proportion of illness that we see from the S techs. And so they have come out and they are now adulterants as well. And so whenever we're testing products to make sure that we can get rid of E. coli, 
we have to make sure they can get rid of these six as well. Uh, when we talk about ready-to-eat heat-treated products, um, again, we've got the 1994 um, adulterant that came out with the sausage products. We've also got what we call the Reed memo that came out. And Reed was a USDA official. After we had that outbreak, they formed a, what we call the Blue Ribbon Task Force, and it was of government officials, academics, and plant managers. And they came down and agreed to steps that have to be taken to ensure that E. coli is not in those products. And Mr. Reed sent out the memo to all the plant managers, and they all agreed to adhere to it. All right. And so for that one, we still do have to address E. coli and salmonella in our HACCP plants. And then we also have Listeria monocytogenes, which became an adulterant and ready-to-eat products in 2003. And so we have to very specifically address Listeria control in that ready-to-eat product. And then we've got Staph aureus as well as the Clostridials, both Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium perfringens that we have to watch out for in ready-to-eat products. So as we go through the different segments, we look at the on-farm. Um, and looking, this is a picture of, in my mind, I would actually consider that probably a medium-sized medium feedlot in the United States. So you can see the center right there, and so the processing, the grain mill, um, that one will probably hold about 150,000 head. We've got feedlots back home that will house upwards of 500,000 head at one time. And so they'll run through over a million head in that feedlot in one year. All right. And so on these, we don't have official control for bacteria necessarily or foodborne illness. But there are certain guidelines that they follow, and the plants expect them to follow these because we can minimize the risk and we can minimize E. coli shedding and bacterial shedding from these animals. And the first one, clean water. This is actually from a water trough that took in South Georgia. All right. Not what I would consider a clean water tank. That needs to come in. We need to clean that out. A lot of times we can't necessarily do the chlorinated water because we're pulling out of wells. But we need to at least make sure it's clean. If we have the ability, come in and use chlorinated water. So human potable water, if at all possible for them. Make sure the pins stay clean. The trucks stay clean. If we think about it, when those animals are going through, that E. coli or bacteria is really in two places. It's either in their intestinal tract, which they're going to shed out, or we can contaminate, or it's on their hide. And so that is the vector of transmission when we go through the process. So if we can make sure that those pins are clean, the trucks are clean, and the animals are clean, we can greatly minimize the risk when it gets into the slaughter. Um, some other suggestions that are out there that we've looked at, switching diets prior to slaughter. Most of our animals in the feedlot situation, they're actually consuming a high-grain diet, very acidic environment. And so it, evidence has said if we switch that diet over and put them on maybe a high forage or roughage diet right before slaughter, we'll actually flush a lot of E. coli out. Something that's a good idea. Some of us are concerned about it because... If we're making that E. coli mobile at that point, we could get more contamination. So, right? And other ones they've looked at, feed additives, ionophores, antibiotics, competitive bacteria in the feeding system. Um, wildlife exclusion is a big one, but that's actually pretty hard to do on farms. And so can't do much about it. And then the newest one out there is using vaccines and bacteriophage. And so vaccines have been out for a while, haven't been widely adopted. The big reason that been widely adopted is because we're not giving the producer and the feedlot a monetary incentive to do so. But we do have them out there. This is an SRP vaccine, and we also have some tier protein vaccines that are available and seem to be somewhat effective. So in plant, we've got the antemortem talked about, and so looking for the disabled, diseased, dying, and dead. This is Dr. Tant. So he's an inspector in charge, veterinary inspector in charge, out there looking at those animals. Um, again, postmortem plus HACCP, looking for residues, diseased animals, process controls, uh, sanitation procedures, standard operating procedures. Our inspectors, when they come in, especially if we have a new one, the first thing they do is they go to our locker room 
and they pull our HACCP plan, our GMPs, our SOPs, and our SSOPs. And they will sit down and read through them. So if we're doing something wrong, when they come out on the floor, they know exactly what they're looking for. And that's been every single plan I've ever worked in. Um, once we get past uh, here, we have post-mortem inspection that continues. Uh, largely, we do E. coli and salmonella carcass sampling. And this isn't specific to 015787 7 or the other big six. This is really looking for generic E. coli and some generic salmonella. And it's going to tell that inspector, are our interventions working and are, is our sanitation protocol working? On salmonella, first deviation, we have to establish our corrective actions. Second deviation, we have to reassess our HACCP plan and implement new corrective actions. Third deviation, they shut our plant down until we can fix it. For generic E. coli, when they come in, it is one out of every 300 beef cattle has to be sampled, and one out of every 1,000 pork needs to be sampled. And that might seem like it's not enough, but when we have a plant that's processing 25,000 head of hogs in one day, we're getting 25 samples coming out of that system every single day. Right? And so it's if one sample on E. coli is greater than 100 CFU, then we fail. If we have three of the last 13 samples that have 10 CFU or greater, we fail. And this becomes a rotating thing. And so just because we sampled 13 and we're clean doesn't mean we start back at zero. It means 12 and 13 are still there, and we've got to go through another 13 before we can be out of the weeds. Um, enhanced testing of beef for STEX, um, so the MT sampling and continuous inspection going to retail. We'll talk a little bit more about the MT program. So interventions that we've got, live animal, there's a hide wash. Uh, some people have started looking at this and have done it. A lot of them have pulled back off of it. I personally am not a fan of hide washing unless we can do it early enough to where we can dry that hide off. Because if we wash that hide, it's wet. We stun that animal. We hang it upside down. Now we've just turned dried manure into mud. And that mud is going to run down the carcass, potentially contaminate. And so until we get a better system, I'm not a big fan of hide washing. Clean facilities, feed restriction um, on the carcass. Again, hide washing, de-herring has been tried. Very effective, but very hard to do. Um, standard operating procedures, GMPs are in place. On the carcass, we'll use organic acids, usually a lactic acid, citric acid, acetic acid. Um, use hot water. Use steam. That steam has to hit the carcass or come out of the nozzle at least 180 degrees, so it's 160 when it touches the carcass. Um, and that's what the bottom picture is right there. Carcass getting ready to go into a steam jacket. And then we'll also have our temperature control and carcass trimming. Subprimals and joints, when we break that carcass down, we'll go ahead and treat those with organic acids again, which is what picture up here is, as well as temperature control going through the process. Um, we talk about the MT testing, and so MT testing is coming in and testing trim or product destined for ground beef. And so we've got 60, MT60, which is for product that was produced on the slaughter site. MT65 is testing of product that was not produced on slaughter site. And so I'm a plant that's grinding product. I'm buying it in. I fall under MT65 because I'm not slaughtering anything. These do what we call N60 sampling. And so we have to limit the lot. We have to lot the beef out. And we have to limit that lot to no more than five combos or 10,000 pounds. And out of that, we have to collect equal number of samples going up to 60 samples from each combo. Right. And so this is routine testing that goes on. And then finally, MT43 is final ground product testing. Every time we grind product, we pull a sample and send it off. USDA gets a memo, says it's time for them to pull a sample, and they come in and do so. At retail, again, no federal regulatory activity, but federal law now states in 2016 that the retail store does have to keep grind logs on their product. All right, so we can have trace back. And so I have to keep the date, the time, the manufacturer, the source material, the supplier lot, um, the product code, the pack date, establishment number, 
date and time the grinder was cleaned and sanitized, all has to be recorded. And so if you're coming through and cutting steaks for the retail case, that has to be recorded at that point because in two days later you might pull those steaks and grind them. I'm right, going to go through these fairly quick, but as we get into our ready-to-eat thermally processed products, we've got four main categories that we fall under. So fully cooked, shelf-stable, fully cooked, not shelf-stable, not fully cooked, not shelf-stable, and not heat-treated shelf-stable. And this one is the one where a lot of my research is focusing on right now. Um, main ones for concern, fully cooked, um, shelf-stable, and not shelf-stable are Estex, Salmonella, Clostridials, Listeria, and Staph. All right. And so for this, the Estex and Salmonella are taken care of in the thermal process, has to be validated. Clostridials and uh, staff are controlled by the thermal and cooling processes. And we can't have more than one log growth in the bacteria after the process is done. And we'll talk more about Listeria in a minute. Not fully cooked, not shelf stable. Um, this cannot be labeled as ready to eat product. And so it has to be has to have handling um, guidelines on it as well. Concerned with Salmonella, Clostridium, Staph, and Estex, the Estex have to have a validated kill step associated with it. Salmonella, Clostridium, Staph, controlled similar to fully cooked products. Listeria, we're not concerned with this one because it needs to be fully cooked at the house. But we do usually include inhibitors in the product. Not heat treated shelf stable. Estex have to be addressed. Again, staff and clostridium are addressed through fermentation processes on these. These are fermented products. And so we have set degree hours that based upon fermentation temperature and pH down to five or five point three that we have to meet. And so we look at clostridial and staff controls, again, thermal processing. Cooking guidelines through Appendix A in USDA, cooling guidelines through Appendix B. And so the cooling guidelines state we have to cool from 130 to 80 in one and a half hours and from 80 to 40 in less than five hours. All right. If we have nitrite in that product, so it's a cured product, we're given a little bit of grace period because nitrite greatly reduces or inhibits clostridium. Listeria, big one that's out there. So, post-lethality exposed products. If we cook that product in a bag and never touch it again, no problem. But if we do touch it again, we have one of three alternatives that we have to put in place to control listeria. One is post-lethality treatment to eliminate, plus antimicrobial agent to suppress growth. The second one is post-lethality treatment or antimicrobial treatment, plus enhanced testing of food contact surfaces. The third one, which is the one that I utilize in my plant, it's control of processing environment through sanitation. And on this one, we have advanced environmental food contact surface testing plus the product testing has to be done. For STEX, um, not fully cooked, not heat treated, shelf stable products, we have to meet one of five guidelines. First one is utilize heat process it's validated to kill the product. Second one is a 5D inactivation, so 5 log reduction of E. coli. We can also have the third one, which is a combination of hurdles to get 5 logs. We can conduct test and hold on the finished product, or we can do raw material testing plus a 2D inactivation of that product. And so just some challenges and kind of where we're going. Need to focus on live animal interventions, put in some incentives for producers, new technologies for destruction, some of the ones that are out there. Spend a lot of time looking at high pressure processing of the finished product, plus bactericidal and bacteriostatic packaging. I've got a couple former grad students that are working on these with their companies right now. Enhanced rapid detection methods that are out there that Francisca talked about. End user education is a big one. That's extremely hard to do. And then finally looking at possibly salmonella as an adulterant is one that's out there. And so put this one up there and just kind of some things that maybe where we can go in the future working with uh, Ken, Ken and the Mekong Institute. Um, 
getting together and working on things that include producers, slaughter and processing safety, retail and consumer education that's out there. Major things that need to be addressed, not only in the United States, but everywhere. And so some potential there. Additional crosswork with students in food and animal sciences. We already have a really good relationship with Konkin University. Um, and like to see that enhanced and grow, including potential of us bringing students over here um, to work. And then getting together so we can evaluate and respond to specific issues as they come up, whether it's a country, a phase of production, a location, or employee training as we come through. So with that, I'll stop and thank our gracious host. So thank you. Good. Thank you very much to Professor Alex. Well, I think we are still in a good time. We have an, roughly 30 minutes for the question. Uh, well, now the floor is open for the question and comments. But before we go to that point, I would like to invite all speakers up on the stage and be seated. เปิดไฟให้ด้วยนะคะเอ่อสําหรับนักน้องนักศึกษาไทยนะคะยังพอโทรพอที่อาจจะยังไม่กล้าถามก็เขียนใส่โน้ตได้นะคะขึ้นม
of developing the uh, indigenous plant species, right? In for uh, function of food, it may have the problem about poisoning or other uh, other ingredient that is not good for health. Yeah, it, it like uh, lupinus, the the one the bean from Italy, the one I show Brimi in in my slide. That one have the poison also. They have to they have to know how to get rid of that substance. Yeah, they they learn from the previous the use of the 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 the, the old people. They know it like uh, many of the lysome of our local vegetable. We have some uh, problem for that, but they, they they have to do. They have to have some special uh, procedure to to handle that. And actually, the 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 use of the indigenous vegetable, uh, the easiest part we we can look at the uh, component of the traditional food. We have to go together. It lie in uh, Isan food or Lao food. That if you cook with this one, you have to put another one inside to to prevent it. Like a bamboo shoot, they have some high, very high oxalate. You have to put some another herb put together. Uh, 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 yeah, nah, yeah, you have to put together. It's something like that. Yeah, we can learn from the traditional food mostly. Yeah. So I think that Professor Alex will answer for the second question, right? And also Professor Kochimo will add up some. For the for the second question, um, I I understand that that tradition um, and and culture that's there, but it it becomes one of those things. Quite frankly and simply, you can't see bacteria, and if that product has not been handled in a sanitary condition, that product's never been cooled down. There are no guarantees that you can be free from any food safety risk. And I'd venture to say even further that even uh, under a lot of our strict controls, even with E. coli as an adulterant that we have, uh, we still find it in about 0.2 to 0.3% of the product that's out there. It's an adulterant not allowed, but we still do get it with all the controls that we have. And so even everything we do, there is no 100% guarantee of a bacteria-free, pathogen-free product that's there. Um, if you take that product, and a lot of other countries I've been in, animal might be slaughtered out back somewhere. It's, a, it's an area for slaughter and maybe a back alley, and then the, the meat marketer will come back, and they'll actually pick up a quarter or a side of an animal, and they haul it up to the front market street, and that product just hangs there all day long, and people come by, and order half a kilo or a kilo, whatever they want, and the, the butcher cuts it off. And usually their, their child is standing there with a switch, keeping flies and other things off of it. Um, you know, with that, there is, there is no guarantee to it. And the, the way to make sure if that uh, custom is uh, near and dear and you want to keep it is to make sure that you're doing everything as in, as in sanitary uh, condition in which you possibly can. He has answered <laughs> for oh, everything. I think in this area, Northeast, we also eat something similar to your country. And I don't know what to say. It's difficult to change. Uh, most of, of the, the kind of, of meat that you cook like that is not get into the... the Standard slaughterhouse. Normally, they do it at the backyard, but it's really fresh, and they are free from from the the bacteria or virus. It's okay, but if you keep it for some time, it's dangerous. Yes. Well, this is quite interesting. I, I just want to know that for the home cooking meal, like mommy or daddy cooking meal, what is the maximum temperature and how long? Have to can be get rid of the salmonella or E. coli, and it is this thing is applied for the all kind of meats or not? 
for cooking temperature and handling at home, when we talk about salmonella and E. coli and, and the red meats, uh, we've got a time temperature combination. But when we get into ground product, so anything ground or comminuted, it needs to go up to at least 160 degrees. And if we're talking about certain poultry products, it needs to go up to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, and looking at it is not a way. So cutting into it and saying, oh, that's not red, doesn't work. You have to use a thermometer for it. Um, now, when it comes to whole muscle products, steaks, um, I prefer my steaks medium rare and closer to rare. But as long as it's not a blade tenderized product, I'm okay and feel safe with that because the contamination or potential contamination is on the surface. And so that surface is coming into contact with an area that's over 160 degrees, which will kill the bacteria that's there. But anything ground, and I, I grew up in a butcher shop eating raw ground beef with a little bit of salt on it. And that was our snack is we'd run around the butcher shop. Would never feed that to my daughter. You want to add up something else? Okay. Not at all. Any questions? I'm curious about uh, irradiation. I know it's a very charged uh, topic and it's been uh, it's failed mostly because of, of consumer perception more than any other reason. I guess the question first, I have two questions. One. Uh, first, uh, for Alex, uh, uh, do you do you think that if the assuming that the salmonella is ever declared an adulterant, do you think there would be any hopes that people will really, the industry or people will resort to to irradiation? And that's a, the first question for Alex. The other question regarding to irradiation: what what is the perception in in Thailand? and in the region regarding uh, application of irradiation to solve uh, some of those uh, safety issues? So for the first question, uh, to be quite frank with you, I don't understand why it's not required already. Um, it, it does have a negative consumer perception associated with it. Uh, but we are allowed to irradiate certain poultry products. We are allowed to irradiate ground beef patties that are uh, either individually quick frozen or already cooked. Um, a lot of those products are already allowed. They have to contain the radora on them, the symbol that shows that they are irradiated. Uh, my, my big thing, big hurdle with irradiation um, when we get into beef and pork is to really make it effective instead of treating thousands or hundreds of thousands of smaller pieces, uh, ideally we would need to be able to find a way to irradiate that carcass. And so if we could pass that carcass through irradiation before it goes into our rapid chill cooler, we know after that point that contamination happened because of a breakdown either in sanitation and handling in the plant or further down the chain. Um, I would think that if something like salmonella being adulterant came along, the industry might try and approach it again, um, but in the United States, we've been told by the, not the current administration, but the past two administrations, don't bring it up. So. Second question. Um, actually, I'm not from the faculty of food science, but uh, for some, some product, we did do the radiation. But for traditional food, it's impossible for them to change. And uh, some of the product, for example, fermented fish or, or pork, and we think the, the pH, the acid, could kill all the bacteria. But uh, for fish now, they, they, they really change. They are uh, cloud up the fish meat and put in the freezer my my minus sixteen degree before they they do the processing so it kill all all the the parasite.
but for meat or pork, I'm not sure what they are doing. No. Any questions so far? If not, I can, can ask my question go to Professor Kapon. Yeah, um, what is the challenges for the future move of the functional food in Thailand? You can see from my slide there, we, we, uh, we have a problem about the uh, research in the medical science. There is a big, big, uh, big gap. Yeah, that is a serious one. We need people from medical science to come to from the beginning of and the whole process. Yeah, the whole time. Knowledge of, of, of the local people. Do they no. understand what is functional food? I think uh, most of the educated people, the new generation, they learn from the internet. They start to understand and eat a very, uh, quite a good food now. Kaiser open can be the function? Not, you think? not, not, not all. Kind of. It de depends on the definition. You have to put something in there. But uh, like you put high uh, calcium or some uh, bacteria. Yeah. 45 foot. Any question from down, down there? <laughs> no questions so far? So I think if there is no question, maybe this is a good time or good opportunity that all the speaker, maybe you have something that you want to add up from your present presentation because I think that 30 minutes, maybe it's not enough for you. You have any unmentioned or unrevealed part that you want to add up? Professor Alex? One of the things that, that I'll add, and I had it on the slide and didn't, didn't touch to it, but when we start thinking and talking about food safety, one of the biggest hurdles we get is the thought of food safety is a culture. And it was really impressed on me whenever I was working in the industry and HACCP was implemented. Um, that's one of the things that they always push is that it has to be a change of mindset. And a lot of times it can be very uncomfortable. We don't like it. Um, we want to stick to our traditions, but it has to become ingrained in the culture as far as what we're doing to ensure a safe product. And eventually that will take over and get to a point where the culture of food safety becomes so ingrained that you continuously start looking for other ways, other methods, other processes to ensure a safe product. This is a good uh, point. I think medical school at KKU has been working for over 10 years to get people around here to understand that they cannot eat raw fish because it has a uh, Parasite, and now they change the way they cook. It's it take quite a long time to to change, but it can be, hopefully. Thank you. That's uncommon. Do you have something to add it up? I, I I didn't put one of the very good picture in in my slide. We we have two big problem now. One is in uh, one is agricultural problem. It's a long time. It's difficult to solve. We, we produce only raw material for export without value added. It's a very big one. Now we have all people working in the farm. And but we have to get really good quality products to go for the processing or to develop other product, high value product. This is one problem. Another problem is I already mentioned in, in my slide there about the health problem. A really serious one. 200, 200 billion, 200, 200,000 million baht per year to spend for healthcare, for the only NCD, diabetes, uh, CBD or whatever. The way to solve this one have to go from the innovation in terms of food. We have to use food as a medicine. This is my last one. Yeah. I think, can we eat meat like a medicine as well? Can we eat meat like a medicine as well? 
there is some nu nu nutritional value uh, I, you're, you're asking somebody that's very biased, um, but but yes, I mean meat as far as uh, a nutritious product is pretty hard to beat as far as the amount of protein, the fats, the types of fats that it has, and and so meat is an extremely important part of maintaining a healthy, well balanced diet. And that goes a long way into preserving health. So I think it it is a component of the entire process. I think that if you take a um, high amount of lecithin, which is inside the meat, right, red meat, lecithin, Is there any any nutrition or is there any component inside meat that can can cause a disease or uh, as far as that can cause disease um, th there's a lot of debate and discussion about that uh, and it's a lot of it centered around uh, specific types of fats or fatty acids that are there whether saturated fat is bad for you whether omega-6 fats are worse for you than omega-3 fats. Um, and a lot of the information that's that's been around for a long time and is coming back out with research is showing that saturated fat is not having the issues with cardiovascular that, that we've been told it has for a long time. Um, the omega-3 fats and uh, CLAs um, do have some... Uh, anti-obesity, anti-carcinogenic properties associated with them, um, some anti-inflammatory properties associated with them. Now, are they there in the level to elicit a response becomes the question. Any further question? Okay, on that note, I think we can have a short coffee break, but uh, allow me to thank our speakers for this afternoon, the first set. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamal, Dr. Kuchakorn, and Dr. Alex. Let's give them a warm round of applause. And also, let us, let us also put our heads together to Ass Assistant Professor Pai Kai Jan for uh, wonderful moderation of the question and answer. Before we go on with our tea break, uh, I would like to remind again that we have a cocktail reception at 6 p.m. So please, Stay. Uh, oh, sorry. Five thirty. Yeah, five thirty. So we'll have a cocktail reception at the for, for first floor at five thirty. And now it's time. It's time for us to stretch our muscles for a while. So we will have a short, a very short coffee break for fifteen minutes. So please be back here by three fifteen, and uh, we will have a new set of distinguished speakers by then. So see you and have a good tea break. I'm 30 now.